I'm happy to welcome all of you to our conference panel number five, which is focusing on love and world poverty. We have a num number of eminent guests to comment on this. First of all, we have Professor Dr. Heidi Hadsel, who is the president of Hartford Seminary. We have Amina Zalmina Rasul Bernardo, who is the lead convener of the Philippine Council for Islam and Democracy, former presidential advisor and concurrent chair. We're pleased to welcome as well Imam Faisal Abdul Rauf, co-founder and chairman of the board of the Cordoba Initiative, founder of the Asma Society, the American Society for Muslim Advancement, and also uh, the Reverend Dr. Emily Towns, Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at Yale Divinity School, Andrew Mellon, Professor of African American Religion and Theology, um, Uh, yes, and uh, I'm sorry, President of the American uh, Academy of Religion. Academy of Religion. I apologize, Emily. My notes failed me, alas. And uh, we are going to start um, our afternoon session with a very short video clip that we're going to show now, and then we'll proceed with our presentations.
This was provided by one of our presenters that originally had been promised a spot on the world poverty section and was unable to keep it. And so these are, this is in uh, support of the Millennium Development Goals, which uh, are obviously relevant to the topic at hand. With no further ado, I'll yield the floor to Heidi Hadsel of Hartford Seminary. We decided to speak from here so that you could see us <laughs> better. Good afternoon. Um, I am um, intending to be short and simple. Um, I don't have a clock or a watch, but you do. So uh, keep me on, keep me on schedule. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. As we think about Christian teachings regarding the poor, uh, three things stand out. The first is the intrinsic worth and dignity of the poor. The second is God's special regard and uh, regard for and love of the poor. And the third is an awareness that at a certain point, a uh, point that isn't absolute equality, but at a certain point, uh, the gaps between rich and poor make human community not only unjust, but untenable. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly about each of these and then move uh, forward. Um, dignity. We've talked about this a lot in these days. Um, we've discussed this across our Christian Muslim lines. I think we agree that as children of God, uh, the poor, like anyone else, are bearers of intrinsic worth and dignity, uh, worth and dignity, and are always to be treated as such. Uh, intrinsic worth and dignity. Um, and uh, we talked a few days ago about um, finding God in the face of the poor. Second, uh, while God loves all of humanity, God, Christian theology teaches us, Jesus teaches us, has a special regard for the poor. So God loved all of humanity, special regard for the poor. There are biblical texts which suggest that through their poverty, the poor are often in a better position than the rest of us to be able to love God fully through their poverty, often in a better position than the rest of us to be able to love God fully. Uh, they are without attachment often to material goods and status, and thus are also often better able to see things with greater moral clarity and less hypocrisy and then the rest of us, and in this sense, be teachers, moral teachers for us all. You will know the biblical verse, where your treasure is, your heart will be also, uh, and um, uh, the Bible teaches us very clearly both about the special privilege, although it doesn't advocate poverty, but the special privilege of the poor in terms of moral clarity and the tendency um, that um, the rich and even the not-so-rich have towards uh, hypocrisy, um, wishing to see the world um, in ways that favor themselves um, and thus not seeing it very clearly. Again, the observation is by no means used in the Bible to advocate keeping poor poor, just uh, pointing out a special perspective of the poor. And then finally, while absolute material equality is not, as far as I can tell, advocated in biblical texts, there is indeed a sense that great inequality between rich and poor is indeed destructive of human community and therefore destructive of human relationship with God and with human flourishing, and it is fundamentally unjust. Therefore, Christians are called to love, respect, and be in solidarity with the poor, 
learn from and with the poor, work actively for justice for the poor, and indeed there are a number of biblical texts which indicate that uh, loving the poor is tantamount to loving God. Indeed, loving the poor, the homeless, the needy, the weak, the widow, the unprotected, are the acid tests of faithfulness. Um, without those acts, one cannot claim to be a fully faithful Christian. This biblical theology requires a, re a, a rejection of the kind of Christian theology often associated with my own country and my own reformed tradition that equates prosperity with godliness and poverty with sin. Uh, that is not biblical theology, um, although one hears that theology. Um, and it also requires, the biblical theology requires a rejection of the the, the theology, the so-called theology of prosperity, which is common in Christianity around the world today, um, in which Christianity is viewed as a way, um, essentially, to find favor with God and therefore wealth. In terms of global poverty, although this ethic, this Christian ethic, was developed, you know, several thousand years ago and in very intimate circumstances and much smaller communities, in terms of global poverty, this, tra this ethic translates into a call to take active measures to combat poverty around the world, to seek for structural justice nationally and internationally. The Catholic Church has uh, long developed a substantive critique of economic justice and uh, the injustices of capitalism. Uh, and there are many other examples as well within the Christian communions of attempts to develop theologies of, um, that um, begin with the basic theology um, I have just uh, outlined from the Bible. Another example would be the World Alliance of Reformed Churches, which has done considerable work in this area and argues that for Christians um, who seek to address the suffering and the injustice caused by poverty, the massive economic inequality and injustice uh, especially, but not exclusively, between North and South, is really a test of one's faith. Um, and it should be seen as a test of one's faith. Um, and um, um, they argue, the churches of the South argue to the churches of the North, um, that the churches of the North are being unfaithful um, in their ignorance, or their ignoring, their willful um, ignoring of the plight of the poor uh, in the South. Similarly, the World Council of Churches has worked for decades on issues of global economic injustice um, and works today still with colleagues from the UN to do things like support the UN Development Goals, which we've just seen a uh, film about. In a conference that we have here, in our conference on word and deed, our common ethical teachings regarding the poor are a good place to start when we think about common deeds. We've talked for several days about common words. Um, this is the session where we think about common deeds. And certainly, if there is um, one uh, place where Christians and Muslims can come together in terms of common deeds, it is in this question of global poverty. Um, it has been said that this is a historical conference. 
It is indeed, and we can perhaps really make history by working energetically together on common issues of global poverty. Perhaps uh, in closing, I will say two more words which um, you will find familiar. The first is just to observe as biblical texts observe um, continuously over and over again. Um, the challenge of breaking through human egoism, human self-satisfaction, human ability to lie to ourselves and deceive ourselves, um, and um, all of the ways we find to hide um, in, and um, therefore not address the issues of uh, global poverty, and uh, those will be familiar to Muslims and well as well. And finally, perhaps the second challenge, which is also a common challenge um, for Muslims and Christians, is to extend our care and our concern um, for the poor uh, beyond our poor, uh, beyond the poor of our country or our religion or our region of the world, um, and to care equally and vigorously um, for all of God's children and all of the poor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Hadsel. Now we'll yield the floor to Amina Zalmina Rasul Bernardo. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you all. Yes, all this afternoon. I've decided to write everything down so I can keep to the 10 minutes because otherwise I might um, extend. I'm going to uh, talk to you a little bit today about the situation in our part of the world, uh, the poverty in the midst of conflict and what we are doing about it, uh, specifically women's groups and interfaith uh, organizations. I consider myself a very fortunate person in as much as Muslims can consider themselves fortunate these days. I am a Muslim woman born in Southeast Asia. Our brothers and sisters in the Arab world may see us to be at the periphery of the Islamic world, but our region is home to the biggest number of Muslims in the world who live in a multi-ethnic region which has a tradition of peaceful coexistence, where men and women both play active roles in public and private arenas. However, our world is changing and our liberties are at risk. In the minority Muslim areas of Thailand and the Philippines, for instance, our liberties are at risk from internal conflicts with our own central government, taken to a new level and complicated by the global war on terror. The radicalization of Muslim groups, the expansion of extremist religious interpretations of Islam does not help us Muslim minorities. We are at risk from within and from without. The radicalization of our Muslim communities is rooted in the need to survive, physically as well as culturally, from perceived threats against our, our faith. It has been shaped in part by reaction to the impact of the so-called intrusive West. Muslim communities are being radicalized proportionate to their failure to modernize themselves relative to their environments. Pressures on non-Western societies are gathering force under globalization. Globalization has been seen as a threat, an imposition to a people's identity and culture, even as it brings economic um, development and profit. Modernization can be traumatic, particularly if forced and hasty, and the transformation away from tradition puts our societies under deep distress. The World Bank had identified two seemingly contradictory forces affecting the world order, globalization and localization. Globalization forces our governments to go beyond their borders in order to cope up with the progressive integration of world economies, 
with the, while localization manifests itself in the increasing assertion of local people for political or religious identities. This seems to be one of the paradoxes of globalization. As world capital, trade, finance become integrated, local identities tend to resist these homogenizing processes. This resistance post 9-11 has taken on added impetus among Muslim societies. Globalization has been viewed by some as a weapon against us. It is in this context that we should address the radicalization of our Muslim communities. While we need to prepare ourselves to compete in an open society, we need to preserve our Islamic identity, and the world needs to accept us as part of the community of nations. Many political analysts conclude that the Western dominance had impressed on us, the Muslim world, a sense of our weaknesses, which has led to Islamism. Islamism is the expression, they say, in religious terms, of frustration over the failure of modernization in much of our world. Islamism, they say, is the rebellion of the excluded, the marginalized, the poor, which feeds on the frustrations of impoverished peoples living on the margins of an unattainable consumerist world. Last month in Jakarta, over 200 leaders of the world's religions and faith-based organizations came together, came together to grapple with these issues during the Second World Peace Forum, which was chaired by one of our co-delegates here, uh, Pat Din Shamsuddin. The leaders asked, can faith and religion combat violence in a world where religion has been ill-used as the banner for armed conflict? When governments are embroiled in war, what can civil society and faith-based organizations do for peace? When the majority of the world's population are poor and marginalized, can faith-based organizations be the lever to equalize the gains of globalization for the few? Muhammadiyah President Shamsuddin, who chaired the conference, hoped that the forum would not only provide a venue for dialogues of peace among key leaders of world civilizations, but also to explore how the values of humanity, common destiny, and one responsibility of humankind could serve as an integrating force in efforts to eradicate the problems of violence and ensure world peace. I was invited to that conference to speak on the Muslim situation in the Philippines, and I will share with you what I said then. Twelve years ago, my government signed a final peace agreement with the Moro National Liberation Front. This was in 1996. Today, twelve years after, peace is still a dream, very elusive, and armed conflict has become the norm. Poverty, inequity, injustice are factors that continue to radicalize our communities. Radicalization in the Philippines, and I think this is also happening in southern Thailand, is also fueled by the absence of the rule of law in areas of conflict. We have rule of the lawless in the areas of conflict where those who have arms rule. Add to this the stark economic realities in my homeland in Muslim Mindanao. For decades now, Muslim Mindanao has suffered. It has the highest poverty incidence in the country at 54%. It is the only region to actually register a negative growth rate in per capita income. Name the indicator, we've got it worse. It has the highest illiteracy rate, it has the lowest educational attainment, the highest unemployment rate, the worst health indicators. Everything is bad where we come from, but it did not used to be like this. Before armed conflicts began, Muslim Mindanao used to be relatively peaceful and relatively progressive. Armed conflicts came and everything changed. Unfortunately, Islam is being used by radical elements to recruit supporters as a unifying cause for their struggle, as if to say, we are poor and oppressed because we are Muslims. 
Unfortunately, long-suffering uh, Muslims have responded to this call, and this is a dangerous trend which must be neutralized. Unfortunately, new factors, criminality, human rights violations as the, st as the state wars on terrorists, corruption, inability of the state to serve and protect its citizens, these are creating tensions that could crack our fragile peace. We need the dialogues to focus attention on the real causes of the conflict, and these have very little to do with God. We in the Philippines are lucky in that interfaith dialogues have become an integral part of peace-building efforts. The peoples of Mindanao, who subscribe to different faiths, are not at war with each other, and we know that. We coexist, but as of today, we coexist in a fragile peace that can shatter quite easily. Since the early 70s, various institutions and civil society groups in Mindanao have initiated interfaith activities and continue to be committed to advancing interfaith dialogue among different faith communities in Mindanao. Due in large part to their work, there is now wider recognition of the shared values among the different faiths that can be used as basis for peace building in the region. Some of you have actually been to Mindanao and have shared with us, helped us in these initiatives to bring peace to our region. We need to expand the interfaith dialogues to interfaith collaboration to deal with the issues of poverty, inequality and injustice, the protection of human rights and women's rights and children's rights against policies that could be based on a fear of the other. Moro civil society or Muslim civil society in Mindanao, though still young, is growing in strength and number and participating in interfaith initiatives. Among the more active and vocal of these groups are the women's organizations. It is the women who bear the burden of caring for their families as the fighting result in hundreds of thousands of refugees who until this day have not been settled. We Muslim women of the Philippines are caught between, how do you call it, a rock and a hard place. The rock is the state's militarization and the oppressive way it secures the peace. Ignorance about the Muslim faith makes many Philippine political leaders tend to perceive our religion itself as a threat. The hard place is the aggregation of some extremist fundamentalist groups who want to monopolize Islam. These groups have accused anyone talking about democracy, about moderation, about the partnership between men and women for development, of being un-Islamic and anti-Islam. It seems to me that these groups tend to focus on women's obligations alone, forgetting that women under Islam also have rights. In Mindanao, ordinary women have become more vocal in expressing their disenchantment with the non-implementation of the peace agreement and the slow peace processes that are taking place in my region. They have become active in conflict resolution programs, in mass action to start armed conflict, in poverty alleviation. This emerging women's activism is a direct response to the burden that women bear. While we are not responsible for the war, we are responsible for taking care of our families. So much responsibility is laid on the shoulders of women, and yet women are still not heard but only seen. A devout young Muslim woman wrote to me and said, the society where we live now is in peril. We can no longer live in apathy. We cannot just wait for the miracle to happen. Allah will not change the conditions of the society unless we change it ourselves. We must do what must be done. I guess when we ask today about the next steps and what should be done, I think that is one recommendation that we would make, that we must change the situation ourselves and that we must be heard. And for that, it is not only the Muslim woman who must be heard and refuse to be silenced. I think all of us, must go out there and be heard so that the common word will be brought to all of the corners of our communities of the globe and maybe then 
we can see the reforms in the community that will finally bring peace and show to all that love of God and love of neighbor is within us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amina. Now I present Imam Faisal Abdul Rauf. In the name of Allah, the most merciful, the earth uh, merciful. The God of Abraham, the God of Ishmael and Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of Mother Mary and Jesus Christ, the God of John the Baptist, and the God of Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon all these noble prophets and messengers. I would like to thank... Uh, Dr. Wolf, His Highness Prince Ghazi, and all of those who made enormous sacrifices to invite us and to give us the opportunity to meet with many dear and beloved friends and brothers and sisters and to make new ones and to work and to share together the work that we are doing to bring about a common word between Christians and Muslims. I've been invited to speak about love and poverty. And I'd like to begin to share with you some thoughts I had about my own personal struggle with the meaning of these terms. When I was a young lad, I was accused by a lady whose heart I was pursuing that I was an incurable romantic. Oh, Faisal, you're in love with love. And as I began to learn about other religions and the, Christ faith, the Christian tradition, I recognized that perhaps my love with love, and since God is love, also meant that I was in love with God. And as I embarked on my spiritual journey, I began to ask myself, what does it mean to love God? and to love God with all of one's heart, one's mind, one's soul, and one's strength. And I looked at the way I understood the word love, or we use the word love. I love my parents, I love my wife, I love my children. I love mathematics, I love swimming, I love movies, I love lamb chops. But who is the lover? And what is the action that defines the act of love that we use when we use the same term in these different contexts? When I say I love mathematics, it is the love my mind. It is an act of the mind. When I say I love my parents, it is I think what we call, Christians call agape perhaps, respect. I don't love my wife the same way as I love my daughter. Uh, I love swimming is a physical action. I love lamb chops or lamb kebabs means I love to slaughter a lamb, skewer it, grill it and eat it. Now there have been cases that we've read about about people who have done that to human beings have cut them up and boiled them and eaten them. But the, the, the question here is, how then do we love God? What is the action that I have to do to demonstrate that I am loving God? Is it a physical action? Is it a mental action? And, and, and how do I know that God loves me? What are the signs? These are among the things I struggled with in my spiritual journey. And I got some glimpses, and I could share with you perhaps, if you don't mind, uh, some teachings from the writings of a great Sufi teacher, Sheikh Wali Raslan, who lived in Syria in the 12th century. 
in which he talks about the importance of giving a concept which the Sufis called togetherness with God. Ma'ayyah, they say in Arabic. From the verse, the Quranic verse, in which God says, وَهُوَ مَعَكُمْ أَيْنَمَا كُنْتُمْ Allah is with you wherever you are. And therefore for us to give the, the notion of togetherness with God its due. And he says, this means we have to understand and abide by the protocols of love, of adab, of proper courtesy and morality that is due to the Creator. And he speaks about three tracks. At one of ma'ayya, of togetherness, at one dimension or one track, is when you are present with God in keeping with the standards of behavior proper to the sacred law. And I'm reminded here of the quotation of Jesus Christ which was mentioned by His Highness Prince Savazi when he said that in the New Testament Jesus adds upon these two commandments of loving God and loving neighbor hang all the law and all of the prophets. All of the sacred law emanates from this love. I think Professor Godless also spoke to us about working on a sacred law or a, a, a law of love. So to put into practice whatever God has commanded us to do and forbidden us from doing is one track of loving God. It means that all the limbs and organs of our physical body are actively engaged in worshipful obedience to Him, that we spend as much time of our time in His service. And he adds, at this stage, God will screen you from the distracting influences of your lower self, your nafs, and your circumstances and he will enable you to witness his gracious favors upon you. At the intermediate dimension, you are present with God in keeping with the standards of adab proper to the spiritual path, adab at tariqah This means that you are cognizant of your personal non-existence. You are in relation to the service, in relation to the Creator, in relation to the service in which you are engaged, since there is no work more eagerly hoped for by the seeker than the work that has no visible connection with you. At the next dimension, or some say the highest degree, you are in present with God in keeping with the standards of behavior proper to reality, adab al-haqiqah. This means that you recognize what belongs to you and what belongs to Him, to the Creator. For the reality is that to you, to us, belong poverty, belong weakness, belong incapacity, belong ignorance, and belong abject humility, while to the Creator belong affluence, strength, power, wisdom, and glory. This is what our brother Professor Mahmoud Ayyub pointed out when he talked about po the poverty of power, poverty, lack of power, lack of affluence, lack of strength. And when you realize that, Sheikh Raslan says, that to you belong non-existence and to God belongs all being. When you recognize that you are contingent reality, a zero, and Allah, the Creator, is absolute reality and being. And when you are present and walk with God with this awareness and in keeping with these standards of behavior, then your haqiqah, your reality, is in sync with God's reality. And then you allow your envelope to be the theater or the canvas on which God's infinity and splendor intersects your zeroness. And then he adds, God will screen your poverty with his affluence, your weakness with his strength, your incapacity with his power, your ignorance with his knowledge and wisdom, your abject humility 
with his glory, your non-being with his being, and he will display his splendor upon the canvas of your being. I'm reminded of the line in the chariots of fire where this runner says, God made me fast and when I run I feel his pleasure. And we've all had moments like that when God gave us a talent when we, when we deploy that talent we feel the pleasure of God coursing through us. At this stage of togetherness with God you will witness nothing but his actions and his characteristics. Your personal existence will fade into insignificance. Every attachment will take its leave of you. The spiritual station of unification, maqam al-tawheed, will be rightly and properly yours. All that is superfluous will depart and you will come to be numbered among the singular people, Ahl al-Tafreed. All these experiences are among the results of togetherness and this is what enriches because I have discovered for myself and for those of my congregation in my circle that when we begin to open our hearts to knowledge of God at the experiential level the issues that were gr gripping us whether they are of political problems fade into a different level and we notice and we experience that togetherness with God is most enriching. I've just discovered that I'm over time I think. One minute over. So I will have to cut the rest of my talk and make a p two things. A plea before God and before you to acknowledge my need and desire and our need and desire to have God display his power, his wealth on the canvas of our poverty and weakness. And I plead to you, my neighbors, and in the words of Reverend Shula this morning, to seek your love for me because of my need for you, to seek your love for the world's poor because of their need for you. And I pray to the one God whom we both adore whom we both worship and serve, that he grant us the strength, the capacity, the patience, and the persistence to work towards an era, a time, when our Christian and Muslim communities will live by our one co common word of God, whether the word of God made flesh in the person and teachings of Jesus Christ, or the word of God made speech in the teachings of the Noble Quran. Amin, and may God bless us, and I seek your forgiveness for my overtime. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Imam Faisal. No forgiveness needed. We appreciate your words. We're happy to welcome uh, Dr. Emily Towns of Yale Divinity School. Good afternoon. I'm somewhat amused at the invitation to participate on this panel because the key ethical and moral category I deal with in my work and teaching is justice and not love. But I decided to hit the global find button on my computer to see what I do in public lectures when it comes to love. I realized in that search that I actually do talk about love a great deal and it is always paired with the conversation about justice. Reflecting on this for uh, is, is reflecting on this is for another panel and a different conference. But in recent years, one piece of literature on love that has been informative for me has been the African-American woman writer Toni Morrison's novel, Beloved. 
Morrison has been informative as imaginative play partner and theoethical muse as the book tells the story of U.S. slavery and its brutalizing effects on the body and soul. In one particularly moving passage, the ex-slave baby Suggs preaches a sermon in a clearing in the woods to the ex-slaves just barely beyond what we call in the U.S. the in in invisible institution that is slavery. And she says this to them. Here, in this here place, we flesh. Flesh that weeps, laughs, flesh that dances on bare feet in grass. Love it, love it hard, because yonder out there they despise it. And then after cataloging of the various parts of our bodies and telling the slaves and us to love ourselves, she ends, love your heart, for this is the prize. Her sermon is a concrete material kind of love, love of body, love of self, sense of location, sense of community. Love is seen then in most, as one of the most crucial and central concepts in Christian theology and in ethics. It is also one of the most theologically, ethically, psychologically, and culturally morally ambiguous concepts. Love is considered one of the three primary theological virtues along with faith and hope in Christianity. An analysis of love has often centered on love as self-giving agape, which has frequently been defined as disinterested love. Now if agape is practiced loosely, and I would argue incorrectly, it supports the belief and practice that love is entirely a matter of what you or I unilaterally offer to someone else. Agape, however, should not be individualized in such a manner. It is at heart a sharing of experience, a recognition of our underlying kinship in the realm of God. I believe that if the concept is to mean anything, Love requires an ethical, a moral community. An ethical practice does not occur in human isolation or in individual decision alone. It arises within community and directly by the commitments of the person in a particular community that has practice of love, and this is where it takes form, receives content, finds direction, achieves fulfillment. Now, as a Christian social ethicist, when I try to wrap my head around love and poverty on the global level, a key, a key question for me arises, and that is, who are we as religious folk when we enter into this discussion? Now, I'm not the first person to note that human beings are prone to radicalizing certain behaviors. We can turn initially positive knowledge into negative values. We can turn good thing, we can make good things emerge from disastrous quagmires. Put another way, our reference points for living are contextual. And we become dangerous when we fail to recognize this about ourselves and then suffer the temptation of absolutizing our knowledge. For instance, it is ironic to me as a Baptist that the modern-day Protestant work ethic has moved so far from the 16th century theologian and church reformer John Calvin's ideal. Calvin's ethic is one of grateful obedience that leads to self-denial. He held together love of God and love of neighbor in which we extend charity to our neighbor and share with that person our blessings. However, there is a tension in Calvin's moral command to pursue one's vocation in the world with vigor because it is a sign of being chosen by God and Calvin's moral injunction against ostentation and spending. Now Max Weber's point in developing the Protestant work ethic is that a religious ethic can legitimate a socioeconomic form that was not part of its original intent. 
And my point for this afternoon is that it also leads to programs that, uh, to recognize and combat poverty that are often unaware of the kinds of religious values that form their roots with those of us who are Christians. And the makers of these policies are then ill-equipped to critique their assumptions because they cannot remember what they never knew. For many, if not most Protestants, a major part of who we are religiously in the United States stems from an enlightenment conception of the self in which there are natural inherent rights for all peoples. And each person is an independent unit who is an autonomous, self-determining ego. Key is the notion of autonomy. In Protestant religious faith, this is a concern for principles of authentic belief and practice that is validated by an appeal to human experience and reason. And in its worst form, it means we are the world. This has loosed an unrestrained or rampant individualism in many of our private and public beliefs and practices in the US that stress personal responsibility and despises any hint or the reality of dependency and more importantly, our interrelationship with one another. Stressing personal responsibility while detesting dependency encourages conceiving society as a necessary evil to monitor so that it does not inhibit our personal freedoms. Society shouldn't get in the way of our individuality or our ability, often seen as God-given, if not ordained by God, to use reason and personal experience to justify all manner of private behavior and inept attempts to address poverty. Stressing personal responsibility while detesting dependency often wedges the diversity of human isness into a stultifying and in some cases death-dealing homogeneity that is healthy for a precious and elite few. So as Christianity has defended the autonomy of the individual to stress the value of every human being, of our freedom, and great respect owed to each and every one of us, we have, in far too many ways, radicalized this notion such that we are now reaping a bitter harvest from the unrestrained exercise of our passion for possessing, for self-assertion, for power, as individuals, as a nation, and in our social institutions, and far too often in our homes and in our religious worlds. However, the Protestant work ethic has helped build large segments of our culture and society, and it carved out enormous national wealth based on a capitalist economy. It has often been one of the engines fueling some movements for social change, such as the civil rights movements in the United States. Recent movements in public housing complexes, often led by women, to take back and define their living spaces so they are safe and equitable and just. Economic empowerment in which churches set up independent corporations to address community problems and issues. All these and more rest to varying degrees on the values of hard work and thrift. The difference in these movements and an understanding of society as a necessary evil is that their understanding of society in many if not most segments of poor communities in the US and in other countries is the notion of uninhibited personal freedom remains a utopian folly. Advancing public policies that see society as a necessary evil has truncated the lives of the poor. Many black folk in the United States see current public policies as forms of genocide. This is even more deadly when we consider public policies that have a direct impact on the lives of black women and children. Now this becomes a muddle for many of us as we think through how we are going to um, understand poverty and constrained opportunity. But we rarely do more than listen to those who must endure and survive inequities when we think about poverty. But we, and perhaps one of the reasons we remain so skeptical in the U.S. about our government's ability to do much about poverty either here or on the global stage 
is that our theological worldviews do not offer us much of an alternative either. And this we must change. For if we refuse to yoke our individual selves and concerns within the matrix of life with others, we will never be able to truly engage in a deep and abiding faith that lives with a joyous yet determined spirit of justice, love, and peace. Our traditional religious and spiritual faith talk will take us away from our daily needs. We will be even more complicit with the growing numbers of the poor we see and don't see in our midst on this planet. For religious folk and Christianity itself will no longer be the sigh of the oppressed or the heart of the world without a heart, as Karl Marx said so well. Now, I believe with every fiber of my being that we are called to love one another by finding ways to live that love through acts of justice, in part by eradicating poverty within our countries and on the global stage, and certainly within our religious homes, morning by morning and day by day, because here in this place, we are flesh and we are spirit, and we must love it and love ourselves and love one another hard. Thank you. My name is Bola Ajibola. I am from Nigeria. I want to ask a very serious question. Devoid of rhetorics, devoid of platitudes, devoid of glossy talks, who is here that will tell us that he loves God? But even including those who are addressing us here, if it is so, what is it that you can tell us to indicate or to demonstrate or to show us that you love God? Let me tell you a story, a short story. Some research fellows in a country wanted to know about this problem of who loves God and who believes in God. And they quickly went into a mosque where people were, preach, uh, were praying. And they got there with a knife. And they said to the people there, if there is anybody here who believes and who loves God, please stand up, you will be killed immediately. For some time, nobody stood up. But someone screwed up, screwed up his courage and said, yes, I believe in God and I love God. They took him out. And they came back with the dagger flowing with blood. They said, okay, we have dealt with that one. Who is next? Who can tell us here again that he loves God and he believes in God? Nobody stood up again. Then there is a boy of six sitting close to his father. And he went and touched the man with the dagger and said, you see, this is my father. He tells me every day that he believes in God and he loves God. He should tell him. And the father started beating the son and said to the son, who told you that I love God? Who told you that I believe in God? You want me to be killed? And he kicked the boy out. I want you to let us discuss very seriously, very practically, very realistically, what is all this about the love of God? Let's face it and let's answer that question. Who loves God here? Yeah. Let him stand up and tell us. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Prince Bola. Would any of our panelists like to like to address that? It's not a question. Okay, that's a comment. I, I, I would, um, at the risk of being simplistic, I think, as I tried to indicate uh, earlier, I think in Christian scripture, the acid test of love of God is love of the poor. Um, and so who loves God? 
the person who, who does mercy and justice uh, for and with the poor. Yes. Uh, thank you. It's, a, it's an open question um, to all the panelists on the topic of love, uh, world poverty, and the Millennium Development Goals, which we started off on. Uh, I was interested in the recently established charity Dubai Cares, um, which has already become one of the world's biggest providers of schools, teachers, educational supplies to the developing world. Um, really important projects in Djibouti, Sudan, Bosnia, Niger. Um, the charity uh, is favoring Muslim communities um, uh, in these projects. And my question is, are there any uh, moral or religious issues raised by providing aid on the basis of shared religion uh, rather than solely on need? Would any of our panels like to address that? Again, um, I think that's a challenge for us, um, for Muslims and Christians alike. I'll speak for Christians. I think there is, um, a, that is a moral question. And um, at least in Christian scripture, I don't see God saying, help the poor that look like you and believe like you um, and um, that are your, uh, only your immediate neighbor. Um, I, I see Christian scripture saying, help the poor. They're God's children. Well, from, from where we come from, um, the, the Muslim organizations have, there's a very big imbalance between the capacity of the Muslim organizations, religious organizations, and the Christian organizations. And it has become a partnership between the faith-based Christian organizations and the faith-based Muslim organizations for funding support to flow from those who help. And there is, uh, there is no problem among the ulama organizations in having this kind of partnership because at the end of the day, you are talking about protecting your neighborhood, loving your neighbor. So it does not really matter where the resources come from as long as it goes to protection of children and family and women. And this is how the two faiths um, show their love for each other. Now, um, the one moral question, however, is the source of the funding. And this is where uh, our ulama, our muftis, should really be advising us. And um, if we are going to follow is, uh, what is halal, there is a question now about the source of funds. In the Philippines, a very big source of funding um, that's accepted by the Christian faith-based organizations comes from legalized gambling. Obviously, we cannot accept that. But there are times when no questions are asked, especially since the funds um, flow through several sources. So sharing resources, we do not have much problems about that. But the source of the resource, I think, is something that um, our religious leaders should be looking at. Some general comments on, on the general subjects that were raised. Um, well, poverty or poverty in general is a function of many complex factors that we uh, didn't have time to go into today. Um, I've been involved with some who are involved in the Millennium Development Goals and in, certainly in Sub-Saharan Africa where the, the observation was the, the prevalence of malaria, for instance, was discovered to be a factor in uh, six of the ten Millennium de Development Goals. And therefore, by just curing malaria alone, you will, you will do a, a, a tremendous amount to ensuring uh, you know, a, a more prosperous society. Another factor which economists, friends of mine have shared with me is the existence of systems. Uh, there are systems. And the reason why, for instance, uh, even with the current economic climate of the United States, uh, Chinese money still is invested here because we have institutionalized uh, systems and guarantees whereas China for its development, India for its development does not have the institutions uh, so set forth. These are very important factors, these systemic um, maladies which uh, afflict many of the developing countries are fundamental issues which, which, which really impoverish a nation. Uh, the greatest capital of, of, a, of a human society is intellect, is the human capital. 
intellectual capital of capacity to work. Nations like, Ch like Japan, like Hong Kong, like Singapore, in, uh, Singapore and Hong Kong import everything. All of their food is imported. Yet Singapore's economy is one of the most robust economies in the world. Why? Because banking laws are very, very strict and very secure. Um, you need uh, that kind of proper governance, systemic governance. Um, in fact, the president of, uh, of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, was invited to lecture once in India. And one of the questions that was asked of him, if we give you a 27 by 18 mile square of land, can you create a Singapore in India? And if so, how long would it take you? I think it's still taking about 15 years. But he added, at the end of those 15 years, they will not want to be part of India again. <laughs> um, the point I'm trying to make is that if we're going to address world poverty, yes, charity is very important. It's an important thing in all our faiths and Islam too. There's no doubt about it. Helping of the poor is, is, is important. But the leveraged way to address this, this, the issue of poverty in much of the world today is addressing systemic uh, issues of structural uh, governance issues, number one, and addressing issues like malaria, which affect the efficiency of people in being able to work. Uh, regarding the, the comment, and relates to the comment that the brother from Nigeria spoke about in, in terms of, of, uh, of, of poverty uh, and who is the poor. One of the things that we all have to navigate around, as those of us who are trying to be change agents in the world, positive change agents, is that we have to balance between what I call different forms of correctness. There is religious correctness, ethical correctness. Then there is political correctness, which is kind of like your story, like the joke. I think there's parts of the joke you didn't share with us about the blood and the dagger and where it came from. Um, but but very often, we, we ha if, if we are politically incorrect in a given environment, your work will not have traction. So the question is, it's like I tell my, you know, when marital couples come to me and, you know, the, the man tells me, oh, my wife, you know, and the woman says, oh, my husband, these women, men are brutes, you know, they're brutal, and etc. And men think this way, women think this way, and I, you know. I say, look, the, the men tend to be logically correct and emotionally correct all the time. So when we're emotionally incorrect, we get slapped on the face and we don't know why, what is it that we said that was wrong. So we have to navigate logical correctness, emotional correctnesses, uh, political correctnesses, which are very important. The reason why the Israeli-Palestinian problem isn't solved today is not because of an intellectual lack of capacity to solve the problem. It is because of the required focus of political will to, to counterpoise the dynamics or the physics of political correctnesses on each side, on various sides of the, of the stakeholders. So what is required is a strategic way to, 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 to structure an algorithm, a, a, a formula, that will bring about this, the, uh, what I call an, a, a, a strategic approach that will navigate and balance ethical correctness with political correctness. And these are the kinds of correctnesses which, which, which are embedded in your story. So the father says, no, 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 no. He believes in God. But he cannot publicly say he believes in God because it would be politically incorrect or perceived by the society to be so. So I just share this because in the context of addressing the issues that plague us today, if we are going to have traction, while it is wonderful that we've come today, and I'm <coughs> pleased to it, a lot more needs to be done hmm. in a focused way, in a strategic way. But it doesn't take that many people because the problem is not purely quantitative. It's like solving a mathematical <coughs> problem. Fermat's theorem was not solved by a group of 100 mathematicians. It was solved by one mathematician. Hmm. Unlike physical labor, the problem before us in addressing world poverty, in my judgment, is less of a quantitative issue than of a strategic, qualitative, planning, 
challenge which we have to rise up and meet. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And again, you. I apologize for the time taken. Thank you. Um, just one final comment. Please be brief, and then we'll, we'll close. Thank you. Yes, uh, just a comment. I, I am Metropolitan Mikhail Ayavchuk from the Ukrainian Autocephalous Orthodox Church, serving in America here for our church in Kiev. Anyway, uh, the topic of world poverty certainly um, also links closely to the topic of uh, liberation and social justice. Uh, those themes have been hinted upon today uh, by a number of the panelists, perhaps, perhaps all of them, and at other times in this conference. Um, in Christianity, we've become familiar in, in this gener these generations of talking about uh, liberation and liberation theology, particu particularly since the conferences uh, in South America, in, in Latin America, shall I say, in Medellin and in Pueblo, uh, with the preferential option for the poor. And yes, we do all agree that our faith compels us to have this option preferential for those who are poor and those who are oppressed. Um, all, also, in, in the Orthodox Christian tradition, we have the idea of the sovereignty of peoples and of national churches. Uh, this is not taking place in every part of the Orthodox Christian world, and certainly national sovereignty is, is being violated in all over the world. And I think that, and of course, those perhaps are the root problems of, of oppression and of, of poverty, of political difficulties, and all the rest. Uh, I, I would like to ask the panel if, if they have perhaps a, we can reach a common word on a theology of liberation and of justice between Christianity and Islam, uh, where we can share and combine our ideas on that and on the, so the right of sovereignty of peoples. I'll just Thank permit you. one person to, to, uh, to comment on that. I think that part of... Um, the challenge for um, both of our faith communities is to get a clear sense of what we even mean by liberation. I'm not always quite clear. And often um, when I'm working um, in communities, both here and in Brazil, um, I find that um, there's a tendency for folks to want to rely on, well, the real problem is spiritual, or the real problem is material. And until we can see ways within our faith traditions that we um, refuse to break those two apart and bring both the spiritual and the concrete together so that we understand both um, what we would call in Christianity witnessing, social witness with spirituality. I think it will be hard for us to really develop um, what I think would be a kind of liberation theology that really speaks to the complex issues that the Imam has talked about and how poverty is not a single issue thing. Um, neither is the rest of our living. So if we could begin to develop those ways of thinking in terms of the complexity of our worlds um, and to find the resources within our various traditions to get at that and combine both the material and the spiritual, then I think we have the, a chance of beginning to develop a really um, God-pleasing understanding of liberation. One minute, oh, and then we'll close. This is an important issue because this is something that's happening in, um, in the Philippines. Self-determination is the issue for the Muslim tribes, yes. as we have been fighting for decades against the state. Mm -hmm. And over the last um, decades, the Catholic churches and the Christian churches have actually been with us in the presentation of the issue of self-determination because they recognize the validity of the claims of the Muslim tribes. The difference, of course, is that um, the arena must be the peaceful arena of political change. Yes. And they cannot um, agree 
to the armed conflict that's being waged by the Liberation Front. Luckily for us, both Liberation Fronts are undergoing peace processes. We had a signing in 1996 with the Moro National Liberation Front, and um, next week there will be a signing with the other, with the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, we have to, uh, yes, uh, Sheikh Al Tamimi. Uh, just thank you. I think that the issue of poverty is central, and the cure of this issue of poverty requires us. It requires us applying loving God, having faith in God. Imam Ali said, poverty is almost becoming atheism or infidelism. And I can say that poverty may become violence, terrorism, because when a person feels he's treated unjust, whereby 20% of the world's population possess 80% of the world's wealth, while at the same time thousands and millions die in this world because of poverty and malnutrition. I think in addition to zakat and uh, almsgiving, even though zakat is one of the pillars of Islam as we know, it's a right, it's a duty. It's a duty that the poor have regarding the wealth of the rich. We have to create comprehensive development, especially in third world countries, in the south. They have the resources, they have the material and human capabilities, they have the raw material, and so these countries in the south can, if, if the advanced countries, if the industrial countries stop interfering in the affairs of the poor countries, and if they enable them to have comprehensive development to treat poverty. But I think there's a moral issue here, which is sovereignty, hegemony sovereignty or hegemony over the poor countries by the industrial countries. And of course, this prevents the poor countries from carrying out comprehensive development in their own countries in order to deal with poverty. So these countries, these poor countries are still linked to the industrial countries and dependent on them. This is the fact. All religions, of course, call for combating poverty. Uh, we know that in Islam there's social equality, and the Prophet says, uh, he doesn't believe, he doesn't believe. He said, who doesn't believe? Who is the loser? He said, who is full and has a hungry neighbor, and he knows about him. So it's not a matter of religion. Religion has put forward the cure for poverty, but there is a moral issue between the South and the North, and thank you. Please join me in thanking our panelists for leaving us in a very fruitful discussion. <laughs>